this equation that we saw in the last unit is the basis of what is called the expected utility theory of decision making. This theory relies on five principles or five axioms that underlie rational decision making. Here are the five axioms. The first one is called completeness. The second one is transitivity. The third is substitution. The fourth is continuity. And the fifth is monotonicity. We're going to focus on the first three, because the last two are really there for mathematical tractability of the model, and they don't have interesting behavioral insights coming out of those. Let me start off with completeness. It's a very simple axiom. Completeness says that when I give a decision maker two options, let's say x and y, the decision maker should be able to articulate a preference between those two options. In other words, they should either be able to prefer x over y, or y over x, or they should be able to say that they're totally indifferent between those two options. What cannot happen is for the decision maker to say, well, gee, I don't know which one to choose. Now, we've seen in, in some of the previous units that in cases where there is too much information or when there is overload of data, uh, consumers might actually choose to not choose because they're confused. And that would be a violation of this simple axiom. Let's move on to the second axiom, and that's called transitivity. This, again, is a very simple axiom, and it says the following. Let's imagine a decision maker prefers x over y and then chooses y over z. What this axiom says is, in that case, x should be preferred over z. Now, this sounds fairly obvious. Uh, if you prefer receiving $100 over 50, and you prefer receiving 50 over 20, it makes perfect sense that you want to receive 100 instead of 20. But there are many different domains in which this particular axiom is violated. And I want to show you one simple example. Let's imagine that you are looking for a research assistant. You're looking to hire someone. And you have three applicants, Mr. A, Mr. B, and Mr. C. And for each one of them, you've got data on two attributes. The first one is their IQ, which is based on a standardized IQ test. The second one is the number of years of work experience that these people have. And let's say you've got a very simple rule. You want to choose the most intelligent person. And if, in fact, you have two people of equal intelligence, then you will choose the one with higher work experience. Now, if you look at this data, you've got three people. The person with the highest intelligence score also has the lowest experience. And this is a fairly standard kind of a setup that you might expect in the real world. Now, here's the interesting part. We also know from the history of IQ tests that they're not very reliable. They're not very diagnostic. In other words, a score which is different from 10 points from each other might not really mean that one person is actually smarter than the other one. So if I look at these data, 120 is about the same as 110. 110 is about the same as 100. So if I apply my rule of decision making, here's what it's going to tell me. It's going to tell me that I will prefer Mr. B over Mr. A because they're about equally intelligent, but B has more experience. And likewise, I would prefer C over B. However, if I now look at the whole picture, I will end up preferring A over C, because now the difference between 120 and 100 is significantly large, that by my rule, I end up picking the more intelligent person. So this is an example of the violation of the transitivity principle, and it happens in a number of different domains. Essentially, what's happened here is that the context has conspired in such a way that the decision maker views the attributes differently uh, in making choices. So the literature is replete with examples of the violation uh, of this particular axiom. Here's the third and, and uh, more important axiom. Uh, and this axiom is called the axiom of substitution. And it says the following. If I have two options, x and y, and I'm indifferent between x and y, then I should be indifferent between two lotteries that have x and y as their price. So for example, if I love an apple as much as I love a banana, then uh, and you come to me and say, well, if we're going to toss a coin, uh, in one case, if it's heads, you're going to get an apple. In the other case, if it's heads, you're going to get a banana. Uh, then I should be indifferent between those two lotteries because I was indifferent between the two prizes to begin with. 
Now, one corollary of this particular axiom is something called the cancellation principle. And cancellation says that if I've got two options and I remove something identical from those two options, I should still now have the same preference between those two options as I had before. Now, it turns out again that this principle, the principle of cancellation, is often violated in a lot of decisions that we make. And perhaps the most famous demonstration of the violation of this principle was done by Maurice L.A. in something that is known as the L.A. paradox. Let's look for a moment at this particular choice. Got an, two, two options. Uh, option A, uh, I give you a million dollars, no questions asked. Option B, they're going to play a lottery. In that lottery, there's a 10% chance that you will win 2.5 million. There's an 89% chance that you will win 1 million. And there is a 1% chance that you will win nothing. Now, in this circumstance, uh, what Morris L.A. Uh, found was that most people prefer option A. It's a no-brainer. It's a million dollars with, with no strings attached. Makes perfect sense. Now, let's look at the second problem. And again, if we're choosing here between two options, we're going to call it A and B. Uh, in option A, we have a lottery uh, in which there's an 11% chance of winning 1 million and an 89% chance of winning nothing. In option B, we have a second lottery, 10% chance of winning 2.5 million and a 90% chance of winning nothing. Now, as you might expect, a lot of people prefer option B. So think about it, uh, the difference between 10%, 11% isn't very large. The difference between a million and two and a half million is that much more larger. And so people tend to pick the option B, which gives them a chance of winning the larger prize. Here's the interesting thing, though. If I put these two side by side, what you'll notice is that these two options are essentially identical. These two problems are essentially identical. What I've done is I've taken away an 89% probability of winning a uh, million dollar away from both options. And essentially, by doing that, I have now created a situation in which I can reverse preferences between A and B, and that again is a violation of the axiom. Now, as we go through this course, we'll see a lot of different ways in which consumers and people in general tend to violate not only these axioms of choice, but tend to make inconsistent preferences. And I'd like to leave you with one thought. We've talked about the four C's of rationality, and we've made the point that all of these four C's need to happen for people to display rational behavior. Now, People routinely violate axioms. People routinely do not behave in consistence with those four Cs. But they're just being people. Uh, are they being irrational? Irrationality has a very strong connotation to it. It suggests that people are making a mistake. And in my opinion, if you have a theory that doesn't account for the way in which people make decisions, perhaps that's not the right theory to explain human behavior. Perhaps it's not people that are being irrational. It is a theory that is perhaps not rational. And that's why a behavioral approach to economics tends to be the richer approach.